now live, sir. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking time uh, and tuning in to tonight's Facebook Live. Uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes to, to log on. Um, uh, I'm now uh, reaching out to you as United States Senator Ben Ray Lujan. We've had the honor of being able to connect with constituents throughout New Mexico and a few people that have joined us from other parts of the United States uh, while I served as your United States representative. And uh, this is now the second in the series to be able to connect with Facebook Live. Um, it's still tough not being able to get together in person, uh, but I certainly want to wish you well. I hope you're staying safe with all the challenges that still exist with COVID-19, uh, but certainly appreciate everyone taking time to join us tonight from all across New Mexico. Um, I know that this pandemic has been extraordinarily difficult for everyone. And I know that many New Mexicans are struggling and need assistance. And that's why tonight uh, we wanted to focus on how my office uh, in the United States Senate can work with New Mexicans during this tough time and how we are able to provide support to constituents through casework, uh, to work with our state and our federal partners, um, to make sure that New Mexicans are receiving the assistance and support that they need. While I've only been in the United States Senate for a little more than a month, my office has hit the ground running on providing essential constituent services. And we're already doing a lot of work throughout the state of New Mexico. I'm very proud of the team that we've assembled, um, leaders that came from Senator Udall's office, some that worked with Senator Bingaman, others that worked with Congresswoman Sochi Torres Small, and a few that also uh, worked uh, recently with Congresswoman Deb Holland's office. So just a great team throughout New Mexico that has now joined us. And my priority will be constituent casework, just as it was during my time in the United States House of Representatives. Now, my office can assist you Mexicans on issues ranging from getting your social security benefits, uh, federal tax returns, veterans assistance, and more. And during this crisis, my office can also help New Mexicans with their economic impact payments. A lot of constituents have told us and reached out to us because they've not received them. And so we're able to help track those down and make sure that you're able to get those economic impact payments uh, for everyone that qualifies. Also to ensure that everyone that is able to qualify for unemployment benefits, we can help you navigate there. Uh, food and water assistance or, or energy uh, assistance and federal grant opportunities uh, where we can do searches and work with nonprofits, local governments. Um, and uh, that's just an example of a few of the services. There are many others. So these are just a few ways that the office can work with each and every one of you. And during this pandemic, my staff and I are continuing to work to serve uh, New Mexicans. And if you need my assistance uh, from my office, uh, we wanna encourage you to reach out. So those of you that have access to the internet and every one of you does, otherwise you wouldn't be participating in our Facebook Live. Uh, my website is Lujan, L-U-J-A-N, Lujan.Senate. Dot gov. That's lujan.senate.gov. Uh, or you can reach us through um, our Washington office phone number, and that's 202-224-6621. And uh, we're still in the process of getting all of the state offices opened up. Um, and uh, I've learned through the United States Senate, it takes a little bit of time to get all of those leases approved, but nonetheless, real excited uh, to be able to announce some of those offices here in the near future. Uh, before we begin tonight, and uh, we want to remind everyone, if you have a question uh, on our constituent resources, uh, please leave it in the comments below, uh, and that way we're able to get to some of those questions. If we don't get to them tonight, we'll make sure we reach out to you. Um, also wanted to give you a little update on the work that is taking place with the next round of COVID relief funding. Uh, the United States House of Representatives, uh, over the last week, they recently marked up in committee which is the first step to getting this package adopted, um, uh, showing where these investments will go. And I'm very proud to report that there was significant investment to the veteran affairs um, to provide more support with veterans across the United States to ensure that there's going to be vaccine uh, support to get vaccine in people's arms, namely our veterans, and continue to provide support to the VA. Um, also significant investment to make sure that schools are getting the resources they need to help uh, safely open as soon as possible. Um, there will be an investment now, and I'm very proud of this because I've been helping uh, to create support for this, but in the original plan, there wasn't inclusion of support for broadband expansion, and there will be some support in here 
so that we can continue to make investments to eliminate that digital divide uh, where people don't have access to affordable fast internet. Uh, also significant investment to get more vaccine in people's arms across the board, more tracking and tracing, uh, more direct payments uh, to local and state governments, uh, which is something I've advocated for. That means there'll be stronger budgets uh, with cities, towns, villages, with tribal and Pueblo governments, as well as the state uh, for essential services like our police departments or fire departments, uh, services for seniors. Um, it's all going to matter and it's all needed. And then lastly, direct payments to the American people. So uh, while it's still being negotiated, um, as you uh, know, at the end of the year, there was a $600 um, uh, direct payment. Um, there was a commitment to get it to 2000. So this package will include $1,400 more. And we're encouraged that we'll be able to get this across the finish line. Um, when I return to the Senate um, next week, uh, we're gonna get busy to work uh, to continue what we already did in passing our budget reconciliation package, which I uh, proudly voted for uh, before we came uh, to New Mexico for this week long recess. And then also, um, just to let you know, I've been proudly working throughout the state, uh, meeting with uh, different counties. We uh, had an incredible visit with some of the leadership up in Union County and uh, Curry County with constituents um, out in uh, Curry, uh, Roosevelt, as well as Chavez um, and Lee. Really appreciated those conversations today. Um, we will continue to reach out to leaders throughout New Mexico to make sure we're doing our part to learn from them, to learn from you, and that we're able to uh, move strong policy forward. Um, lastly, before I introduce Pam, I um, also wanna share with you some of the committee assignments um, that I was just appointed to. Uh, first off, I was appointed to the Health, Education, Labor and Pension Committee, which is critically important for all things with access to healthcare, uh, making sure that we're able to lower access uh, 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 costs so that we were lowering premiums and making uh, access to affordable quality healthcare reality, lowering prescription drug prices, uh, providing more support for mental and behavioral health, um, also working on education policy and reform. So very excited about that assignment. Uh, also the agriculture committee. So with the importance of agriculture to the state of New Mexico in every corner of our state, I'm very proud of that committee. Um, the commerce uh, committee, which has jurisdiction over telecommunication, the FCC, trade, um, everything from oceans to uh, trade agreements and also broadband. Uh, so I, I look forward to getting to work, especially with the challenges that we have in New Mexico, uh, the Indian Affairs Committee, and also the Budget Committee. So uh, we'll be putting out some more information soon, but I wanted you to be the first to learn of some of those committee assignments. So with all of that, Pam, let me catch my breath. And now I'm excited to introduce my constituent casework director, uh, all the way up from Mora, New Mexico, and that's Pam Garcia. Uh, she's based out of the Las Vegas office. And so Pam, it's such an honor to have you tonight. Um, and again, everyone just please get those comments uh, down below, get those uh, uh, questions submitted. And there were several uh, questions that were submitted as well. I, I really appreciate constituents being proactive when they see that we send the invitations out. Uh, of letting us know some of these constituent casework questions that they have. So let me tell you a little bit about Pam. Uh, she's worked for my office for more than 11 years and she's currently our constituent services director. She has worked on a number of diverse issues including veterans, disability, compensation, passport issues, social security, um, and so much more. And she also works closely with the governor's team here in New Mexico. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham with their constituent services team on a number of other state issues to serve New Mexicans. Um, as I said, she's originally from Mora, New Mexico, and uh, she, like me, is a fellow alum from New Mexico Highlands University. She has a BA in political science. So Pam, it's always an honor. And uh, I'll just give you an, an opportunity just if you wanna uh, share some opening thoughts and comments about some of the work you're doing, and then I'll, I'll jump into the conversation. Uh, Pam Garcia, everyone. Thank you so much, Senator, for that really wonderful introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you today on this Facebook Live event this evening. It's, it's my true honor to do this work for you and to work with my amazing and dedicated colleagues. Um, you mentioned how great the team is, and, and I will tell you firsthand, they are an amazing group of people. And so um, 
you know, Senator, you have always emphasized how important constituent services is to you, um, how important it is to help people who need help. We encounter a lot of really vulnerable people um, who have a broad range of, of issues that they're working through, and you set the tone for your team through dedication, compassion, and then never letting the challenges stop our ability to solve a problem. Um, and then I would like to take this quick opportunity to introduce our very dedicated casework team. And so really, I want to introduce the whole state staff, but there's a big, huge, long list. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and um, shorten the list a little bit <laughs> and uh, forgive me the rest of the, the team. But I'll uh, introduce the casework team uh, to, uh, this evening. And we have um, Eliza Sultan, who's uh, done tremendous work, even on the, the House side, Angelo Champion out of the Albuquerque office, Cynthia Hull out of our Las Cruces office, Steven Salas out of Las Vegas, Constance Williams out of Portales, and Brian Lee out of Shiprock. And then I want to mention Eric Chavez as well. He's a field rep, but he still continues to do really amazing um, casework and, and just has really great outcomes. So that is our um, amazing dedicated team, uh, our casework team. So I want to thank them all for all the work that they're doing. Um, a very dedicated group of people. And Pam, I was on several meetings with uh, many of them today, and it, it was fun working with them all week uh, with the meetings they set up and the outreach. And what I appreciated this week, Pam, was there was an emphasis in reaching out to rural New Mexico. That, that's where we started with our first week of meetings uh, here in our state uh, with a, a round table on what is going to be needed to close a digital divide in New Mexico and uh, getting some ideas on uh, the work that we can be doing with the FCC, especially under President Biden's administration, and the kind of hearings and legislation that will be important for me to pursue on the Commerce Committee. And we'll be doing that with each of the committees that I'm assigned to. So I look forward to hearing ideas from fellow New Mexicans, especially with the wealth of expertise that we have in our state. I'm so proud of this beautiful place I call home and fellow New Mexicans um, that are sharing their ideas. Um, so with that, Pam, let's jump right into this. The question that I've been getting the most from constituents, especially during these tough times, is how can they sign up to receive the COVID-19 vaccine that is becoming more available to New Mexicans? And what has been intriguing to me is to see how New Mexico is actually at the top of the list of states that has been able to get vaccines into people's arms with vaccine available. Um, one of the disappointments I know that uh, contributed to recent announcements of less vaccine being available is the previous uh, administration, the previous president had committed to states all across America more vaccine. And then we found out at the end of his uh, uh, term in office that that vaccine was not coming because it, it wasn't secured. So states were planning to be able to get that out. It wasn't available. But recently, um, I know that everyone was paying attention when President Biden said that he had secured 200 million more doses. That means more vaccine will be available. And in communities across New Mexico, uh, we're seeing um, incredible outreach. But there's still a lot of people that are trying to figure out how to get the vaccine. Uh, the one thing that I will highlight, though, is I visited with some of the leaders out of the hospital uh, up in Union County. And they've really been one of the stellar examples of uh, what it takes to build a team to get vaccines um, uh, to people that live in the communities. Even where people were calling up uh, from all over the state and they were providing support to first responders from as far as like 100, 120 miles away, um, all the way out to like Ocate and into Angel Fire. Those first responders were reaching out to the leadership um, up at Union County Hospital. So just a special shout out to them. So again, Pam, how do people sign up to receive COVID-19 um, and uh, make sure that they're able to get the vaccine uh, uh, for themselves and their family. Sure. Well, the, the best thing that folks can do is visit vaccinenm.org, and that's where you can register for the vaccine. Um, there's also a phone number you can call. Um, it's 1-800, I'm sorry, 1-855-600-3453. But uh, we really encourage folks to sign up at vaccinenm.org. Um, we also recognize that, um, that a lot of folks aren't able to um, access the website, maybe you don't have access to internet or a computer. So um, 
because the biggest thing you can do right now is to register. Even if it feels like it's taking a while to get your vaccine, please register. Those of you that are watching have access to the internet, please, we want to really encourage you um, to help your parents, your abuelos, your neighbors, other people in your community that might not have access to the internet, uh, please help them sign up at vaccinenm.org. And um, that, that can really go a long way. Again, we know that, um, you know, that people want things to kind of be rolling out more quickly, but in any case, uh, just make sure you get registered and help your loved ones if they're not able to do it themselves. Um, please, please help them out, um, get, your, get your families registered, your, your TOs, get everybody registered that you can. Um, it, it will make a difference. And Pam, who are some of the people that are currently eligible for the vaccine? I know that people 75 or older, old, older and that's where I've been putting a lot of effort in trying to help people navigate or get people signed up myself, right? We can go to the app if we have a smartphone or we have access to the internet and you can actually get people signed up so that way they're getting connected um, uh, or help get them with that 1-800 number. But what other groups uh, or people are eligible right now to get the vaccine? Yeah, so um, in addition to those 75 and older, we do have hospital personnel that are eligible right now, um, residents and staff of long-term care facilities, um, medical first responders, very important, um, congregate setting workers, uh, people that are providing direct medical care and other types of in-person services, um, home-based healthcare and hospice workers, and, um, and finally, uh, people that are 16 and above that are at risk of COVID complications. So those are all the other groups of people in addition to people that are 75 and older that are also in this current tier that are eligible right now. So if you are registered already, um, then you know at some point you will be getting a notice from Department of Health when you can go ahead and visit a location that has a vaccine. Appreciate that, Pam. And then I just wanna remind everyone, look, even though you may have already gotten the vaccine. So anyone that's on right now, that's already received their first shot and maybe their first and second shot. Some people have asked, well, do they still have to wear a mask and do they still have to social distance? The answer is yes, uh, because we still wanna just take every precaution we can to stop the spread. Um, that way we can get everyone vaccinated and we can defeat COVID-19. So just keep that one in mind. Um, Pat, I'm gonna jump to one of the uh, questions that came into the comments. And uh, what we were asked is, can we help connect people with food assistance for kids? Um, the answer is yes. So we can work um, with constituents, right, Pam, to help connect them. And I don't know if you want to chat about that a little bit uh, yourself, but you want to give some of those details of how we might be able to help families uh, sure. connect them for food assistance yeah. for kids? Okay, sure, absolutely. So um, we do have really good relationships through the Human Services Department in New Mexico through the Income Support Division. So um, of course, you know, you have to qualify for those types of resources, but just, just know that even if you're not sure if you qualify or not, it's always worth looking into. Um, so check either with your local um, Income Support Division office, get in touch with us. We can um, connect you with somebody at Human Services to see if you are eligible. Um, there's benefits such as SNAP, uh, um, you know, um, uh, other types of monetary assistance. You do have to qualify, but if you're not sure, please reach out and we will do our best to connect you with somebody who can um, lay out that criteria for you, see if you're eligible, see if your children are eligible. Um, I think that the biggest thing is that if you are eligible for any type of benefit, we want to make sure that you're getting it. Um, if there's not any reason to sort of struggle through through already what's a very challenging time. Um, let's make sure that whatever benefits that you can get, that you do get. So uh, by all means, reach out to us. We will connect you with the right partners and, and just check that out for you. Appreciate that, Pam. Thanks for that thoroughness. You can see why she's the director of this program. Uh, Paul, Pam is a wealth of knowledge and just able to explain it. She cares about people as well, which is something I really appreciate about her. Uh, so Pam, second question. At the beginning of COVID-19, at the beginning of this pandemic, um, I know I was proud to vote for the CARES Act, which included a $1,200 economic impact payment, which was that direct payment to help alleviate the financial strain that many people across New Mexico were facing. And in December, we voted for the COVID-19 relief and government funding that included a $600 economic impact payment. Um, and I'm hopeful that there will be an additional 1400 um, included in this next package that we're working on. 
but let's talk about the first 1200 and then the $600. One of the questions that I received and one of the concerns, and I know there's constituents we helped with, is many New Mexicans experienced delays in receiving their payment and some didn't receive one at all. So Pam, can you discuss how we assisted individuals in receiving their payments and uh, how we can help um, constituents um, with their payments as well, or how the other uh, Senate office or the US House offices in New Mexico can assist people in trying to track these down? Sure, yeah, that's a really great question. And there's a couple of parts to it. And, and first I will say that these, these economic impact payments, they're a lifeline for a lot of people um, for rent, bills, utilities, groceries. So this was a very important um, a benefit for people to have access to. And so uh, we actually um, have a dedicated uh, place within IRS that responds to these uh, economic impact payment inquiries. And so we've actually been able to um, either track payments down if, if uh, taxpayers never received the payments. Through, through our connection with the IRS, we've been able to um, connect folks with somebody who will research where the payment ended up. Um, and, and I do want to make a distinction to, like you said, Senator, between the first round and the second round. So I do want to highlight that the first round, for those of you that never received your first round of economic impact payment money, um, right now, your option, if you are eligible, your option is to actually claim it on your taxes as a recovery care credit. So that's, that's what you will do at this point. If you did not get your second economic impact payment, and I know lots of you are still uh, writing in and calling us that, that you haven't, we will still connect with IRS to find out what is going on with your economic impact payment. Now, um, it does require that we get a privacy release from you um, so we can actually send a congressional inquiry to the IRS, but we still have that option to be able to do that for you. Now, there were a number of different issues uh, why people did not get the um, economic impact payments, and they were situations in where we were able to um, help resolve some of those things like um, sometimes uh, uh, people's payment might be routed to an old bank account or maybe their tax preparer had, um, had incorrect or not up-to-date information. And then that's the information that IRS used to send a payment to the taxpayer. So those are all a bunch of the different things that kind of came up in the process of, of people receiving their stimulus checks or their economic impact payment checks. So um, we do continue to help people try to track those down. Um, again, we're now at the second round of stimulus where we're doing that. So. Uh, reach out to us if you have not received your second um, economic impact payment check and we will send an inquiry to the IRS on your behalf. Um, we will need a couple of things from you, including a privacy release, but we're happy to happy to help you track that down. Appreciate that. And then just a reminder, everyone. So tonight we're concentrating on constituent services and helping constituents navigate. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section. And uh, if you're leaving some other uh, questions or comments, we'll do our due diligence to uh, make sure we're getting back uh, in touch with you on those as well. Um, so Pam, the next one that came in um, is that, uh, and let me read this one from the comments. Uh, this pandemic has been extremely difficult for New Mexicans, working families, and many New Mexicans are out of a job through no fault of their own. Can you tell us how the office um, can assist, and I'll say has assisted, New Mexicans and navigating um, unemployment benefits? Sure, yeah, that's a really great, great question. And um, another, another example of, of where people have really been contacting the office for help with this. So like a lot of federal funding, um, the, the funding comes into the state agency who then manages and allocates the benefit. So while we don't send what we'd call a congressional inquiry um, to the Department of Workforce Solutions, we do refer a lot of constituents to Workforce Solutions, um, those who are experiencing challenges getting challenges getting their benefit. So um, this has really helped when constituents have outstanding questions, or maybe there's some kind of glitch uh, that occurs with the online portal when when people are applying for benefits. 
And really what we're doing is we're connecting constituents with, with somebody, with another human being that will be able to answer questions, get clarification, or just help them get over um, a hurdle in the system that they're encountering. And, and so that connection in itself can be really meaningful. And we've seen, you know, we've seen situations where there's favorable outcomes. Um, not every situation can be favorable, but um, in, in at least all cases, there's clarification. So even if it's not like the most positive outcome ever, we at least get you um, connected with somebody who can then uh, provide an answer for you to, to what's going on with your benefit. Appreciate that, Pamela. You know, I know these have been tough times and, you know, it's frustrating when constituents can't get answers. And that's one of the areas where this is an example of the kind of casework that we do at the office where some may say, sorry, it's a state issue. You know, you have to go figure it out on your own. Um, what we like to do is say, look, this may not be under our jurisdiction, but let's see how we can hand you off to someone and connect you so that we know that you're talking to someone to get some answers as well. So appreciate that, Pam. Um, so Pam, you, you just mentioned and you talked about how um, any constituents um, that are taxpayers that um, did not receive that first $1,200, how they can include that with their tax filing. So we're in tax filing season again. Um, so as we approach tax season um, in the United States, um, can you highlight how the office can be helpful in ensuring and receive your uh, tax refund in a timely way? And uh, I'll, I'll add a couple of them in there as well, but thought I would throw that to you as well, Pam. Okay, that's, yeah, that's another great question. And you're right, Senator, we're coming up on tax season. So everybody get, everybody get ready, get your paperwork in order, um, <laughs> which I have to do myself now as well. Um, so I do wanna start by saying that, um, and in case people aren't aware that there are still a considerable um, amount of tax returns that are delayed as a result of, of when everything was shut down because of COVID last year. So just, just know that that is happening. And um, I think a link will be provided for you where you can visit the IRS website to get the specific update on what's going on with those tax returns. So just know that. So there's still a considerable amount of returns that are, are still delayed. Um, outside of that, though, if, if constituents, taxpayers have issues with tax returns, um, that maybe not getting a refund timely, um, or the IRS is saying you owe like thousands of dollars, um, something, you know, something that's just not, that doesn't feel right to you. Um, and you wanna, you wanna double check, see what's going on. We can connect you with a taxpayer advocate service who will do research um, on your issue. They'll make sure, you know, they'll go through your tax returns, make sure everything is done accurately. If it's not, they will work with you to go ahead and find a remedy to the problem. Um, in some cases, if you have a very outstanding amount of money that the IRS is saying that you owe, um, maybe you can get a payment plan or, or maybe the research that Taxpayer Advocate Service has done will actually reveal that maybe there's some other error. So um, there's a whole range of issues that, that can contribute to um, some issue with your tax returns, tax refunds, anything like that. So um, we connect with the Taxpayer Advocate Service who really helps uh, work with, with constituents through those tax issues, which can, which can be quite daunting for folks, right? It's um, IRS issues and tax returns can be quite intimidating. So um, we're, we're here to help uh, connect you with the folks that will, that will help you out with that. Well, two things I want to do here, Pamela, I'll give everyone an example, but also remind them that the IRS is not going to call you and say, hey, um, uh, you owe us this money. Here's what, what you got to do. There's a lot of scammers out there and they're always getting active like during tax season. They're going to pretend to be the IRS. They're going to ask you for your social security number, your bank information. Do not give it to anybody. You hang up the phone if anyone like that is calling. So Make sure you're sharing with your grandparents, your parents, especially if you have some elderly neighbors, keep an eye on them and make sure you let them know that there's scammers out there that are gonna be calling them on the phone. Um, don't give out any personal information like that to anyone that purports to be calling from the Social Security Administration or the IRS, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, just thought I would give everyone an example of a constituent that we helped back in 2019, Pam. Um, and I won't share his last name, but Alan, uh, who's a constituent, he contacted me because he hadn't received his tax funding even after months of filing his taxes. So he was getting worried and he had been pretty patient. 
So on his behalf, uh, we reached out to the IRS and the Taxpayer Advocate Services to help him navigate the agency process. And thankfully, this is one where we're able to get a positive uh, resolution. And soon after we were able to connect everyone, Ellen received his refund soon thereafter. And what he did is he granted uh, me and my office permission to highlight his casework um, through a success story. So I just wanna thank Alan for letting us share that story because I've found, Pam, that when constituents um, uh, that we have been working with give us permission to share the kind of work that we did with them, and especially when there's a positive outcome that other people hear it and they go, oh, well, I'm facing the same challenge. Uh, maybe we should reach out to Senator Lujan in this case and see if he might be able to help us. So Alan, thank you for letting us um, share uh, that story. And again, we always will maintain the privacy, uh, your privacy when you're reaching out to our office as well. So just really appreciate that. Um, next one, Pam, we had one that came in and this is from Rita. So Rita, thanks for being on tonight. And she's asking if a self-employed barber might qualify for small business relief. And I know that self-employed employees and individuals, uh, self-employed employees, that was a little redundant, self-employed individuals and independent contractors, you may qualify for either the PPP program, which was the program that we created under the CARES Act and the COVID relief funding, or something called an EIDL program, which is also an emergency uh, disaster loan that you can qualify for. And we can also work to connect you with the SBA, which is the Small Business Administration, or the SBDC, which is the Small Business Development Center, to help you with the process. And so as a small business owner, you did qualify for either the first round of funds, and now there's a second round of funds, um, but it's, uh, there's a deadline upon us. And we want to encourage you to reach out to your local lender, or you can reach out to us so we can help you navigate. And if I'm not mistaken, Pam, I actually think that we helped some constituents uh, who were small business owners that were barbers um, that were able to qualify for a PPP loan. I think Eric Chavez actually did that case and it was one where we were able to help him out. So uh, please reach out to us, Rita, or just leave your contact info so we can get in touch with you and help connect you uh, with the SBA or the SBDC. Uh, all small businesses that did not uh, qualify for some of these programs also connect with us so we can see if we can help you and get some answers for you. Um, nonprofits as well. Uh, so uh, uh, fraternal uh, organizations um, through uh, the VFW, for example, fraternal orders of police, uh, those organizations qualified into the second round or we made sure that those nonprofits were able to qualify, even like chambers of commerce. So uh, please reach out to us and so we can uh, be supportive of your efforts. Um, Pam, next one that came in, New Mexicans face um, a digital divide, as I told you earlier. And so intriguing that this question's here, that has left too many of our friends and family members and neighbors from accessing the internet. And it's an issue that is important to me and it's a priority that I'm working on in Congress. So Pam, if a constituent is unable to reach us through the internet, right, through our website or through an email, how can constituents get in touch with us and our offices uh, for assistance? Okay. Yeah, that is a really great question. We do see this a lot. And so while as an office, we do a considerable amount of work digitally or electronically, we do recognize that there are large numbers of constituents without access to internet or computers. And so um, the best way if you don't have access to internet is to call an office. Um, and just what we'll do is a call a state office, especially if it's uh, casework related, um, but call, call up an office. Um, you'll get a friendly voice on the phone we're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions, um, your name, your address, um, other contact information, and then we're going to have to mail you out um, a, a privacy release. And um, we're going to actually, this is a good opportunity to, to, to let folks know what we will need from you when we do an inquiry on your behalf. Um, one, we do need this privacy release, and what that does is it protects your privacy, and it lets the agency know that we have um, your permission as a person that we're inquiring on behalf of, um, that we have your permission to communicate with the agency. Second thing we're going to need from you is a letter. Um, for those of you that communicate electronically, email is fine, perfect, type us up a paragraph, um, 
anything that's clear enough that we can use to share with an agency. We don't want to miscommunicate your issue to anybody. That's why it's very important for us to get something from you in your own words. Um, if you don't have access to the internet, hard copy letter works perfectly. Paragraph or two, just something that explains um, the situation that's going on. But and again, let me, oh, uh -huh. let me ask you a question there, sorry to interrupt there. Um, so if someone maybe needs help uh, putting the letter together, um, mm -hmm. that's something that we could just connect with them over the phone and we could write that down for them, right? So, um, and maybe even help them um, with filling out the case intake form, the privacy release. And then that way, all they need is their signature at the bottom to, to, to do that. Is that something that we can help people with as well? No, no, actually, we cannot write down um, the letter for, we can do an intake, but we really need something in the, in the constituent's own words. Um, again, we don't want to miscommunicate anything to the agency. There's always a risk that maybe we'll write something down wrong. We're not going to capture your issue exactly the way you've told us. So, um, but this is such a great question, Senator, because there are lots of folks out there who, who aren't able to write a letter. Um, and and that's, that's fine. So even though we we can't write it for for anybody what we do encourage folks to do is if you have a family member um, somebody in the community that you that you trust um, to to write this down for you we've actually had some staffers that would have a pastor in their community be able to help write down the letter and so um, again we, we do this just to to provide that um, accountability we want to make sure that um, what you are articulating as your concern, that we're, we're not misrepresenting that when we share that with the agency. So that's why we ask that, that um, you, as a constituent requesting help, you get that down either yourself in writing or ask somebody to help you with that. Um, and that, that really helps us to be able to help you um, get this concern passed along to the appropriate place. Appreciate that, Pam. And now one of the other questions that we receive a lot is about legal assistance, right? Uh, because of the challenges that are out there. And uh, one thing that I want to just remind everyone is that congressional offices are barred. We're not able to uh, provide legal assistance to constituents, but uh, we are able to provide referrals when they are needed. Uh, so Pam, can you walk through that? Because while we can't give legal assistance, we might be able to provide someone a referral or connect them. Um, so can you walk uh, the, everyone through that process? Oh, yeah. And this is a great question. I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up because we, we do see this a lot. You know, there um, we do recognize that there are people out there that are in really difficult situations and, and, and these legal matters are things that we're not able to touch at all. Um, and like the Senator said, uh, we do like to refer you to some other places so that way we're just not telling you, no, sorry, uh, we can't help. But at least here's um, another direction that you can look. Now, one of those resources is actually in New Mexico Legal Aid. Um, they've actually been really helpful for some constituents that we, we referred there who are facing evictions. Um, I know there's been a lot of confusion around the eviction moratoriums, but the great folks at New Mexico Legal Aid were able to provide some great direction for constituents um, and actually had favorable outcomes in those cases. Now, I, I do want to I do want to uh, put out there that legal aid does um, work on issues that affect basic needs. So it's it's a smaller um, it's a smaller group of issues, but it's things like housing, um, income, safety, and then you also have to be under a certain income threshold. So keep those things in mind also as you reach out to New Mexico Legal Aid. But again, they've been really um, they've been really wonderful, um, and and they will let us let us know when they're not able to take something on. But um, they have been helpful recently with some eviction um, eviction scenarios. So that's one resource that we've um, really been able to, to work with and, and has helped folks. Appreciate that, Pam. And uh, just a reminder again, everyone, you know, uh, every one of you has access to the internet. So please uh, go to my website, lujan.senate.gov. Sign up for our newsletter as well. Um, you can also find other resources that we have on the website. Um, you can also reach us uh, at the phone number 202-224-6621. Um, there are phone numbers on the website as well under contact information, so you can always reach us that way. And Pam, I just can't thank you enough. You're, you're an incredible resource. Um, appreciate that you're a fellow Highlands Cowboy alum, so uh, we have that to celebrate as well. And, and just bringing your compassion to people. 
Um, it, it's important that we treat everyone with respect and dignity and that when people need support, we try to figure out a way to work together. And I've learned that from all of you, from my fellow New Mexicans. Um, we're, you're so strong, you're so resilient and, and so knowledgeable. I just wanna thank you. Um, again, special shout out to all of our healthcare providers, every one of you that's out there on the front lines, our first responders, uh, police officers, everyone that's out there helping EMS, helping people on the front lines. Um, you're sacrificing your lives every day to help others. Um, to everyone out there that is administering vaccine, um, whether you're in a hospital, you're in a rural health clinic, um, thank you for what you're doing. And again, special shout out to all of those incredible heroes up in Union County. Uh, thank you for setting the bar high and for the work that you're doing as well. It was an honor to learn from you. Um, for more COVID-19 resources, you can also uh, reach to the state of New Mexico. And that's just at New Mexico, spelled out, .gov, newmexico.gov. And they have up-to-date information and resources as well. And uh, again, just thank you all across New Mexico. I know it's tough, um, but please keep wearing that mask. Keep uh, uh, practicing social distancing. Uh, do everything that you can uh, to make sure that we're stopping the spread of COVID-19. Um, to all of the team, thanks for what you're doing as well. And uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Um, God willing, uh, you know, we'll be out to be able to see you in person here soon. Um, and uh, just last thing to every one of you across New Mexico uh, that took time to send me a text, an email, a phone call, phone message, or a post um, on Twitter or Facebook, uh, sending your prayers um, and, and your well wishes after that attack on January 6th. Um, I just wanna thank you all so much, your prayers and your, your thoughts and just checking in um, made such a difference. Um, as I was on the Senate floor that day, as you know, carrying out our constitutional responsibility, counting the electoral votes. Uh, when that insurrection took place. So it just meant a lot having that support from each and every one of you. Again, stay safe. Um, look forward to seeing you soon. And Pam, uh, Pam Garcia, uh, thanks for being a rock star and uh, for helping people. Everyone, you take care. Have a good night. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.